Hi folks, back to you again and video number three of this series. I thought I'd only have four, but I think we may stretch to maybe five or even six because uh, I've just been thinking that there's quite a lot of material to cover. I like to keep the videos relatively short and uh, in that case it's better to do a series of them than uh, try and pack it all into uh, say just three. Um, so listen, this is what we're going to do now. We're going to look at observation when you're out in the field and indeed when you come back home and you're looking at uh, whatever you've captured on your camera. Um, this is quite a large topic, so this is the one that I may break into two. Um, observation, obviously, we use our five senses and uh, if memory serves me right, about three quarters or 75% of our sensory input is through sight. About another 17, 18% through uh, hearing and the remainder, about 9%, is equally divided between taste, touch and smell. So, as you can see, poor old taste, touch and smell come in in rather a uh, sorry state in terms of, of what we take in and what we process. But they're still very important when we're out in the field because they are sort of back up to what we otherwise are taking in sort of nearly um, as a given, particularly sight. Now, I'm well aware that uh, different folks have different abilities in their senses. And uh, I'd just like to say that that shouldn't be a limiting factor. You know, if you say to me, look, I'm pretty short-sighted and I, I can't see an awful lot, I really would encourage you to put that to one side because certainly I have found over the years that people um, will compensate, their sensory compensation can be extraordinary sometimes, and also um, it's not really important because in our approach here we're not expecting everybody to be A, 100% knowledgeable of what they're looking at, and B, to have every aptitude and every piece of experience that one can get in the field. So. As I said before, we take it slow when we get to a site or even if we're um, out for a long journey, a long walk. And during that process, we use a number of sort of techniques and tools to get our results or to get it at least give us a better chance of getting our results. So first of all, I'd like to look just uh, at the sort of concept of observing in the field. So, um, you know, many people have said that over the years, I should bring out loads of guides and I should bring out loads of information. I should know this and I should know that. Um, if you're new to this, I really encourage you not to get downhearted and say that, um, you know, you don't want, know one bird from the other or you don't know one plant. As you go along, you certainly will find out through photography because it's a wonderful way of bringing back an image without harming the animal or the plant, obviously. And uh, then having time in your luxury of your own um, laptop or phone or whatever and uh, nowadays with the resources on the internet it's extraordinary and um, I'm surprised that guidebooks are still being published quite honestly uh, because some of the quality of the identification material out there is um, on the net is really good but they're nice to have and certainly thumbing through one will, won't do you any harm in terms of gaining knowledge so very quickly I'll go through some that I have used over the years and I'll start with this wonderful little piece here, some of you may know that if you're from the UK, you probably will. It's Pond Life and it's one of the Observer Book series. Um, I know people collect these because they're such a real treasure and an extraordinary amount of information in a tiny little book, which would fit into any pocket. Um, and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're general. They're, they're not sort of academic by any sense, but there's a lot of info. And uh, I can tell you, if you knew what was in each one of those, you'd be uh, quite a star. Um, that one is pond life and it's very general obviously it goes everything from you know one cell um, one cell animals right up to fish etc and newts toads frogs or whatever so um, given that we usually see to begin with anyway we usually see the more common items the more common variety of species out there um, and that really leads me into the idea of if you wish to gain knowledge and if you wish to improve your observation skills start with the ordinary Make sure you know half a dozen of this, half a dozen of that, half a dozen plants, half a dozen mammals, half a dozen whatever, or 20 or whatever number you think is appropriate for your level of experience. Um, it's after that that you begin to see the specialists, the, uh, the type of um, species that only occur, for example, in chalkland or they only occur in a certain type of um, stream, etc., etc. So the issue here really is not to have... 100% knowledge of everything that walks and crawls and flies and buzzes around you but basically go in and become comfortable with the, the objects and the 
pieces that you see around you. And I would include geology in that as well, rocks and fossils, etc. If that takes your interest, and some people aren't interested in that. But um, coming up from that little book, and this is sort of a modern equivalent, and I have these three here. These are uh, Larousse, as you can see, and there's one here, wild animals, birds, wild flowers. These are British and European orientated. Um, that's another thing. You should really try and buy books that are regional, are, are regionalized to you, where you live, or where you spend most of your time. Um, those little books, by the way, um, again, really good. And the reason I say they're really good is they have a wealth of detail in them. Loads and loads of stuff going on there. And they have, although this sounds a bit counterintuitive, they have line drawings and some very nice, I guess, paintings or illustrations rather than photography. For observation and identification purposes, and I'm, you know, I was sort of wondering if I'd say this, but I better say it. A lot of the time, a line drawing by a good artist or a, a, a watercolour or whatever is better than a photograph because a photograph is a one time piece with something like this. And you'll see it, too. They, they give different views of the plant and sometimes you'll see it at different times of the year. They include the fruits or, or uh, you know, the, the leaves and, and different times of the year. So they're really valuable to have. And uh, there again, that's a small item to keep in the pocket. I guess if you're going out for a day, you're never going to know what you're going to see. And uh, this puts people in a bit of a quandary because they say, well, if I was to bring those out, you know, and another half dozen or whatever, I'll have about, um, you know, 10, 15 kilos on my back or wherever in my knapsack, rucksack, whatever, before I know it. And I would say to you, don't do that. Bring one out at a time. And if you see something else, you'll take a photograph of it and uh, you'll be able to bring it back home anyway. But getting familiar with what is out there in the field so that you can get to a stage if you see something, you say, oh, I know what that is. That's such and such. This is such and such. And uh, it won't it won't come immediately to you, but you'll soon get to a stage where you get to know things around your local area. So I am speaking, I guess, here for the relative beginner. So let me just talk about folks that may be further along the trail. You will have a lot of knowledge and you will have some way of documenting that in your mind so that you may already be at the stage where you really will notice um, an unusual or a rare species much faster than others that don't have that knowledge. And that is wonderful. It may be part of your quest with photography. It may not. Um, I would always encourage people to take photographs of everything, including the commonplace, because often within the commonplace, there are different, shall we say, approaches, different angles, different viewpoints that may be quite astounding when you uh, look at your image later on. Uh, just moving on from those small um, publications, which are general, there again, that say this one here, the wildflowers, that covers, you know, hundreds of species. I don't know how many is in there, 250 species. So that's, that's, that's quite a lot to have in your pocket, 250 species. We then go to something, oh, sorry about the shake. Um, we then go to sort of something that's much more um, specialized. And this is just orchids of Britain and Europe. And uh, there again, it's a nice book. I like it. It, it has sort of a more space here to detail the plant which is good you know because sometimes um within orchids for example it can be quite difficult to um differentiate between them and there's a lot of sort of um academic -y type text again if that's what you want to do go off and buy one of those and get into the world of orchids which is an amazing place to be actually at times um this is something that you will find in every sort of car boot sale parish sale, whatever it is. Um, this is the good old Reader's Digest. These are weighty items. Um, gosh, I think this one is about two pounds kilo, maybe. Beautifully illustrated. Um, I wouldn't knock them for a minute. They are just fantastic illustration. And also within them, there's a huge amount of really interesting text. They're well written. They're wonderful, gorgeous books. I actually lo love them. And I mean, tragedy is now you can buy these for a pound or two pounds. And that I would say, with a lot of the generalised guys, you can buy them for a couple of quid here and there. Um, I give a plug to Oxfam, Oxfam bookshops. I hold them <laughs> when I was able to hold them because they really are amazing. And um, a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, you can pick up for a couple of bob, a couple of dollars, whatever it is, wherever you live. We're moving on now in terms of size. Um, this is a beautiful book. Again, heavy, not to uh, not to be lugged around every day. 
I guess what you sh I would say with this is this is something to consult at home to read up later on. on uh, and again, it is quite wordy. It's lots of text down this size here. And we have lots of illustrations here of the butterfly in different stages of its life cycle. I'm, a beautiful book that, but not one to lug around. And just on the localised thing, so something I bought when I went to Yorkshire first, was this wonderful book. Now there again, that does have photography. That is um, one of the ones which I say is, is actually better done than quite a few. And it's got a lot of text there. When you're looking at something, I guess we're looking at plants and animals in their context, in the context of the environment we find them. Um, you know, the other day I looked out the window and I saw a red kite fly over. It's the first one I've actually seen here in a year. Um, I was amazed to see it, but then not that amazed because about uh, 10 miles away or so, or eight miles, is um, Airwood House where there is a breeding program and they obviously release them now and again. This is probably a juvenile bird um, flapping about because it's very cold again at the moment looking for prey. But, um, you know, a bird in its context, I wouldn't expect to see an Arctic skua in the middle of Leeds city centre. I might, you know, there may be one. Yeah, wandering around at some stage. We do see these things in reports and newspapers, etc. But uh, you really think when you go to an environment, where am I? What's going on here? Is it marshy? Is it, you know, a dry area? Is it well drained? What type of rock is it? All this type of stuff, and I'll come back on this later, builds up your picture of what you're likely to see or alternatively not likely to see. Um, just one piece as well. This is, this is, a, this is the coffee table variety of book and this is sort of the thing people get uh, as Christmas presents or birthday presents. Again, not knocking it, it's a good book, a lovely book. Um, lots of illustrations, lots of space on the page I guess. That's the wonderful thing about these size books. My goodness, you know, you go on and on and on with these. Again, if you st if you people still have coffee tables, leave it on your coffee table. And lastly, the specialist or second lastly, the specialist field guide weighty every bee in the uk that has ever been if you excuse the pun um by a wonderful chap called uh, stephen falk who um runs many course uh, when he could uh for the field studies council and i just give them a little bit of a plug because the field studies council are um i guess one of the mainstays of people's knowledge um you know that they've gained over the years they, they run incredible courses they um have worked for years they are all over the, the uk and they produce these type of things as well. And these are just amazing. These are laminated, do -do, do -do, um, very specialised field guides. Now, a little bit of an oddness here because that is a field guide and it's about uh, 10 inches by eight or, or larger. I suppose I could have sacrilege here and pop that into a pocket, but you know, they're still, they're, they're probably tough enough to do that. I think I probably have done that with a number of them over the years and they've survived. And it really is good detailed information. So if you want to get into whatever it is, the Field Studies Council or FSC probably have a guide for it. So that's really the piece around guidebooks and all of that world of nearly a sort of semi-academic approach, if you wish. Um, I guess there's a whole culture, especially in Great Britain for many, many uh, centuries, around uh, gaining knowledge of the natural world and uh, that may be so but it can put folks off in in terms of accessibility they feel put off because they don't have the knowledge or they know somebody who is extraordinarily knowledgeable and they say oh i'll never get to that um don't be put off you know t take take it step by step take it bite-sized get a small field guide start in, in your local area get to know that so i'm going to just cut it here for now i'm going to show you one or two images I captured today. It's really cold again, but beautifully bright out. And this was just a walk out literally um, a couple of hundred yards from my home down to uh, sort of an old um, mine working area, sort of a, a northerly facing brow, which one wouldn't expect much to be going on um, any time of the year, but it's a, an absolute revelation what is actually there. Um, I'll show you those photos and come back to you. So I've just got uh, three photographs of fungi I took today. Um, the first is of jelly ear fungus. It's a very common uh, fungus around this area on elder trees. Most of the photographs you see on Insta and other places are taken from above. It's got a lovely shiny surface from the top. But I thought it was really interesting to take the photograph from underneath. Uh, there again, a little bit of knowledge around how this fungus works, how, where it is, where it's to be seen, 
helps and uh, I spotted this one quite easily. The next shot uh, doesn't have an English name as far as I can find out but it goes by the Latin name it sounds something like Marolius tremulatus but uh, it's a lovely little bracket fungus and it grows in colonies and this is a detailed shot of one of the um, fruiting bodies that come out from the tree of obviously an ancient rotting tree and you can just see the lovely top pieces the little hairs that are um, apparent there it was quite low light and so I've brightened it up one notch again um, again looking around taking a bit of time seeing what's about and not rushing really helps in these situations the la last shot I took just to illustrate the rather insane depth of field that you get with this little camera and um, this is a colony of the aforementioned small bracket fungus which I won't repeat again in Latin and uh, you can see that you've got two or three feet of um, it's still in focus and then you reaches out into the woodland so it's really interesting get some really interesting shots using the focus stacking one always needs to have an item obviously close up to get the stacking procedure to start I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next video so folks there you go that's the first installment on uh, the topic of observation and observations and a little bit on identification and some of the material you might uh, use to achieve your aim um, the next one, hopefully I'll be out in the field actually putting into practice some of the techniques that um, are common to me and may or may not be common to you um, around your photography, around looking for um, the subject matter, around looking for animals and plants in their, in their home, so to speak. So till then, uh, keep safe, keep warm and see you in the next one.